this sermon, The Last Temptation of Christ, uh, but that was already taken by a Hollywood film a few years ago, before some of you were born probably, but promise, I promise there's a film. You don't need to go see it, it's not that good. No, but <laughs> don't rush out. But uh, we've, been, we've been looking at this story about the temptation of Jesus. I think it's very important that young people especially understand this story and understand its impact on their lives because I actually believe that this story is the, is, is the prototype for how everybody might want to consider approaching their key life decisions, how they're going to start their life, the direction they're going to take at the beginning. And the direction you set at the beginning becomes foundational very quickly for the rest of your life. It is not impossible to change course, but it becomes much more difficult. If you get married, it becomes much more difficult to change your mind about whether or not you want to be married. It becomes much more complicated to change your mind on who you want to marry. In our society, it's not impossible, highly not recommended, but it, 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 it becomes much more challenging. If you take a course career-wise, and you get a degree, and you work in that field for three years, it becomes much more difficult at that point in your life to change direction. It's not impossible, but it becomes difficult to explain. Oh yeah, I didn't like that anymore, so now I'm going to go back to school, and I'm gonna, or, or now I'm going to start picking up a hammer. And I'm, forget about my university degree. I'm going to earn my living with a hammer, and I'm going to be a carpenter. I'm gonna, people will go, you're a nut. That's what they'll think. They, it becomes much more difficult. It's not impossible, but it's more challenging. And so I think it's very important in, for young people to set their direction correctly. And so we've been looking at this story of Jesus. We've been looking at it in a, hopefully in a unique way. Hopefully this has redefined some of the details of this story for you. Because we looked at that first temptation about how Jesus is tempted to make bread. And we talked about how it was a perfectly good thing. I mean, there's nothing wrong with making bread. And that Jesus was perfectly capable. He makes bread for crowds on several occasions. It's not difficult, nor is it evil. But yet, even though Jesus is hungry, it tells the story, he doesn't make any bread. We talked about how if God's called you to a task, sometimes even a good thing is, is wrong for you, because you've been called to something else. We talked about the importance of knowing what God's call in your life is. Then we looked at the fact that Jesus, again, a good thing. Jesus is worthy of worship. Right? What does Satan offer him? He says, all of the kingdoms of the world will bow down to you. All of their glory has been handed over to me, and I give it to whoever I want. Well, that's not entirely true, right? <laughs> Satan has a certain amount of authority in, the, in our current age, in, in the fallen world, but he doesn't control all the kingdoms of the world. <coughs> and he doesn't hand them to whoever he likes. That's not actually true, but that's what he says. Jesus is worthy of all of the kingdoms of the world bowing down to him. He's worthy of all of that glory. He created the entire earth. He is the living word of God come into the flesh. That's what we believe. And that word of God is the very thing that created the universe. And yet Jesus says no to that too. Because his purpose while on earth was to live as a perfect human being. And to, to set aside his God as we discussed. And that means pointing all of the glory towards God. And now today the third thing. The third and final element of the temptation story. Satan takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple. And he says, jump. It's, it's perhaps the world's first bungee jump. I don't know that much about cultural history. I don't know when the New Zealand natives invented bungee jumping. I think it was them. <laughs> when they started doing it. But this could have been the world's first attempt at a bungee jump. So Satan brings him up there and he says, go on, leap. You'll be fine. And again, Jesus says, no. Let's look at the details of the story. It 
In Luke chapter 4, it reads like this. Then the devil took him to, to, to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off! For the scriptures say, He orders his angels to protect and guard you, and they will hold you with their hands to keep you from striking your foot on the stone. Jesus responded, The scriptures also say, Do not test the Lord your God. Here, the devil's figured out one of the tricks Jesus is using. As, as we've discussed, Jesus keeps quoting scripture to refute the devil. The devil says, here's, a, here's an idea, and Jesus says, here's a better idea from the Bible. And the devil says, here's an idea, and Jesus says, here's a better idea from the Bible. So then, the, on the third temptation, the devil says, here's an idea from the Bible. He quotes Psalm 91. As we've talked about, whenever you see something quoted in the New Testament that comes from the Old Testament, I always think it's a good idea to actually look at the Old Testament passage to see what it has to say for itself. And we've talked about that some. Psalm 91 reads like this, Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare of the Lord, He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I am trusting Him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from the fatal plague. He will shield you with his wings. He will shelter you with his feathers. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor fear the dangers of the day, nor dread the plague that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. But you will see it with your eyes. You will see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no one will conquer you, no plague will come near your dwelling, for he orders his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you with your hand, their hands to keep you from striking your foot on a stone. You will trample down lions and poisonous snakes. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. I will satisfy them with a long life and give them my salvation. That's awesome. <laughs> Psalm 91 is an awesome set of promises of God that even though you're in the middle of a battle and there are people being struck down all around, that if you trust in God and He's your protection, you won't even stub your toe. That's what the, the promise that Satan is quoting is that if you bring it in the context of Psalm 91, it's that even though you're in the middle of a sword fight, right? And there, there's thousands of people dying right there around you. And this isn't a video game or a movie. I mean, they experience these kind of battles. The people that wrote and read Psalm 91 for the first time had been in these kind of fights. The blood and the smells and the and the, the clang of the steel. They had heard it. They'd experienced it. A thousand people are dying all around you. Ten thousand people are are meeting God in the in the official and final sense. Right there in front of you. And if God's got your back, you won't even stub your toe in the midst of that. And I can't even get across my bedroom at night sometimes. If it's dark and my wife has left one of Priscilla's toys in a place I wasn't expecting it, wham! It's not very pleasant. But what Psalm 91 says is even in the midst of that chaos of battle, you won't even stub your toe. You won't twist your ankle. You won't slip and fall. Nothing bad will befall you. So what's the problem. If that's true, and we certainly believe Jesus is in the love and grace of God, isn't the devil right? Shouldn't he be able to jump? I mean, wouldn't it have been cool? He's at the temple in Jerusalem. Remember, this is the very start of Jesus' ministry. What a way to kick it off! You go to the temple, you're at the very height, and you just take a big swan dive. Off you go, and you just kind of float down, and you come zooming down, and then at the last second, you just kind of stop and float down and stand there and go, Hey guys, have I got a message from God for you? And that's 
not sure the ages would catch me. That why doesn't Jesus jump? He want a way to start a ministry. A, a great act of power, showing the, the, the true courage of our faith, the, the strength of our belief in God. Isn't that what we all should be excited about? We need power ministry. This is a chance for Jesus to show some power. That will shut Satan up. But no, Jesus responds with another quote from the Old Testament. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. If you've got the kind of Bible that has little footnotes, or as we've talked about, them, you have a good app on your iPhone, you already know that this is from Deuteronomy chapter 6. It comes straight out of another story about being in the wilderness. It's, it's very intriguing to me that all three quotes that Jesus gives are from Deuteronomy, and they're all, they're all related to stories that are directly related to the people's time in the wilderness. They're related to his situation, but they also have this, this interesting tie in to wilderness wanderings. The people of Israel, of course, wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. Here's Jesus just at the end of his 40 days in the wilderness. And he keeps referring back to the people and their wandering for those 40 years. I don't think that's a mistake. <coughs> and he, in Deuteronomy 6.16, it says, do not test the Lord your God as you did when you complained at Massah. Now, you probably have no idea what that's talking about. But the people of God got to a place in the wilderness where they couldn't find any water. And they were getting thirsty. They'd been wandering in the desert and they couldn't find any water. And things were getting a little bit tense. And as they do on several occasions, they come to Moses and they say, What? Why did you bring us out here? You brought us out here from the wilderness so that we could die. Now everybody's going to make fun of us. We were wandering around out here, and now we're going to die of thirst. Thanks a lot, Moses. This isn't the only time they do that. They, they do this at Massa. It's, it's also called Meribah. There's two names for the same place. Massa and Meribah. They're, they might be very closely together. No one's really sure. Absolutely certain. But the, the names of them mean complaining and contention. That is, the people were whining and they were fighting at this place. In the midst of that place, it's where Moses strikes the rock and the water just springs up out of the rock. So he takes the staff at the instruction of God, he strikes the rock, and boom, water comes out. And all the people have water. So, this... This passage about not testing God is actually in the, in the context of, of the story that it's originally said in, isn't about not having faith in God to provide. We might assume that what Jesus is saying is, oh no, 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 I'm, my faith isn't like that. Right? that. That's the comfortable answer for some of us modernly minded folks. It's like, no, 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 but faith isn't supposed to refute the laws of science. That's why Jesus doesn't jump. Because faith is meant to be kind of in cooperation with gravity. See, you don't want to push God to break his own laws of gravity. He's not comfortable with that. And so we, we kind of make this naturalistic explanation for the truth. That's what Jesus is really saying, that we should, we should have faith that nature is going to act the way it's going to act. And we, we, we can learn about that. That's not what it's about. Because when you look back at the story that Jesus is quoting, when you look back at the whole verse, and then you look back at the story that's related to, what happens in that story is the people put their trust in God, or at least Moses does, and, and they get the water they need. So it's not a story about not having faith that God can do miraculous things. Because it's a story about a miracle. So then we're like, the question, but then why doesn't Jesus jump? If it's, if it's a story about a miracle, then, and the Psalms all about all these miraculous ways God's going to protect you, if you're one of his beloved, and Jesus is one of his beloved, why does he jump? Well, what does he say? He says, don't put God to the test. Well, what are the people doing at Mass How are they putting God to the test? They're not testing his ability to provide. When they do that, he does provide. What are they testing? I think they're testing his patience. Right? Aren't they testing his patience? Aren't they? Oh, Moses, thanks a lot. You let us out here. To like, don't you think? What are they testing? They're not testing. 
whether God can provide water, they haven't even asked him for water. No, after days and days and weeks and months, years maybe even, of their sandals not wearing out and their clothing not wearing out and them always being provided for and them seeing the army of Egypt, the most powerful army in the world, consumed by the Red Sea, all of that happening, they're being fed by manna day after day after day. And one day when, when they're having a little trouble finding water and their first response is, thanks a lot, you brought us out here to die. It's not, how do we get God to give us some water? <laughs> they just instantly, worst case scenario, we're about to die. Thanks a lot. The testing I think they're doing is they're testing God's patience. And do you know who else at this moment is testing God's patience? I think Satan is testing God's patience. That is, Jesus is tired of this game. I think that when Satan quotes scripture, Jesus is like, all right, that's enough. Give me a break. You're not actually going to try to quote scripture to me. The living work of God. No, thank you. And that's it. That he, he, I think that the reason, that the, it says the devil leaves until there's, it's a better opportunity. Yeah, an opportunity where you haven't ticked him off. I think Jesus is, is growing impatient, you can see. It's like, I've answered your question, leave me alone. I don't know what you think about that. The, the, uh, the other thing that you see in this passage, the other thing that it would do well to touch on, is that one of the things that I see in, in the Christian community around us, I don't think that this is a particular problem that this church is struggling with, but in the days of the internet and all of these things, you're exposed to so many different things, so many different versions of your faith. There's so many opportunities for you to watch sermons on podcasts and, and read books and a hundred other ways to be exposed to, to other ideas other than just what you're getting in your local church, that I want to just quickly address this. The, the fact is, some people then read these stories, and they, they, they read some of the scriptures that we encounter in the New Testament, and they come to the conclusion that what God wants for us is to always be healthy and wealthy and wise. I'm sure you probably heard this. That, they, that God wants for us a perfect life. We should never be uncomfortable. We should never have a problem. We should never struggle. And because... I think that in part what Jesus is doing here is addressing that very idea. Because here's this idea, Satan says, just look at the promise in Scripture. It's so clear. The promise clearly states, your life is going to be great. Right? Isn't that what Psalm 91 says? Psalm 91 says, 10,000 people are dying over here, 1,000 people are dying over here, and you don't even stub your toe. So I just want to quickly address that idea from a couple of passages where we hear it commonly. I hope you'll be patient with me. Romans 8.37 is one of those. You hear it, it says this. It says, in all of this, we are more than conquerors. You may have heard that verse quoted to you before. <coughs> I hear it quite a bit. And in the verse, the we that are more than conquerors are the children of God. So the question becomes, does Romans 8, the same passage of Scripture, define how we know that we're children of God? And in fact, it does. Just a little bit earlier in the same passage in chapter 8, 14 through 17, it says this, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you do not receive the spirit of slavery to regress to fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption, by which we cry, Abba, Father, it is the very Spirit, bearing witness with our spirit, that we are children of God. And if children, 